Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm your host, Ernabel DeMillo. In today's episode, we'll share original stories of Asian Americans who are paving the way for social change right here at home and across the globe. But first, here's a look at what's ahead. Rank and file, Susan Jun reports on New York's finest. Minnie Ro meets the artisanal donut maker who takes a bite out of life with his creation. Game on, did cricket give rise to American baseball? Rainer Ramirez catches up with the team. And my special report on one woman's food revolution in the Philippines. This and more on Asian American Life. The NYPD has the largest police force in the country, but only a fraction of the police officers are Asian American. Here's Susan Jun with more. They're among New York's finest, and they've dedicated their lives to serving others in the line of duty. But for Asian American officers in the NYPD, representation is lacking, and many believe cultural barriers are to blame. To Henry J. Chung, Desne has detective investigator. A career path NYPD detective Henry Chung never thought he would take. Born in China, Chung moved to the U.S. with his family when he was four years old. Growing up in an Asian family, my parents would encourage me, hey, you know, so you to become a uh, doctor, a, a, uh, so you become a lawyer, you know, a business person. Chung initially followed course with a high paying career in finance until the tragedy of 9-11. I remember sitting there, I turned off my computer monitor and I see a reflection on myself. I said to myself inside, like, this has to be more to life than this. That's when Chung decided to volunteer with the NYPD Auxiliary Police. I actually realized that it's more rewarding doing that for free after work than actually my full-time job. After five years volunteering, Chung finally decided to leave his lucrative career and devote his life to a more noble cause. This is my police academy uh, graduation uh, picture. Chung is among the close to 3,000 Asian American uniformed officers currently in the NYPD. That number makes up 8.2% of the NYPD's total of 36,000 uniformed officers, a percentage that doesn't adequately reflect the city's 15% Asian American population, which encompasses all Asian groups, including Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi. Retired NYPD Sergeant Peter Tam, who served on the force for 20 years and is now an adjunct lecturer in police science at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, says cultural attitudes within Asian families create barriers that lead to the lack of representation on the force. For the Asian American culture, the emphasis is the goals of the family instead of, you know, the goals and desires of each individual. If the family does not approve it, some uh, Asian Americans will not go into the police department. And that lack of representation leads to a lack of role models, especially for female Asian American officers, of which there are currently only 241 in the NYPD, representing a mere 0.7 percent of the force. I did not have any police officer in my family. I didn't see it. So I never think police officer can be a job choice of my job. Originally from South Korea, Officer Soo Jin Kim joined the force after working closely with law enforcement as a New York State tax auditor. Kim is now part of the NYPD's concerted effort to recruit more Asian Americans and in particular, Asian American females. Over 10 years, only 0.5 increase in female Asian officers. Lieutenant Angela Ho's smooth path into law enforcement is an exception and underscores the importance of role models and family support as both Ho's grandfather and father were officers in the Taiwanese military. They thought it was a noble profession that I picked, especially um, just in light of the, their service. They're like, you know what, it, it's a good way to give back to the community. Which is what NYPD Captain Chung Yoon Ha had in mind when she became a trailblazer joining the force two decades ago. Ha is the first Korean American female captain and one of only three Asian American female captains ever in the NYPD. I couldn't really see any Asian female officers. I was thinking 
maybe I can become a police officer in my own community and I can serve them. An attitude central to the importance of representation as officers serving first generation Asian Americans have to navigate both language barriers and cultural cues. Asians are not supposed to stare individuals straight in the eye because that would be a sign of disrespect. It's not because they're lying, it's because of their culture. As the NYPD works to close those cultural gaps, the force reports a significant increase in Asian American male officers from 1.7% of the force in 2001 to 7.6% today. Being an NYPD officer is more than just a job. It's a career. In addition to the NYPD's recruitment efforts, TAM sponsors a scholarship for Asian Americans pursuing a master's in criminal justice and teaches a course in Chinese Americans in policing. While efforts to support Asian Americans and law enforcement abound, many believe cultural attitudes are changing as well. I realize it's not just about money and finance in life. There's more to it. To be rich doesn't mean you need only have money to be rich it could be experienced and helping other people and that feeling that you did something you gave back to you know society and the universe for more information on joining the nypd go to nyc.gov nypd for asian american life i'm susan jun in asian american life profiles of bravery Asian Americans are changing the face of New York City's fire department and emergency medical service. In 2005, Sarinya Srisakal became the first and only Asian American female firefighter for FDNY Engine Company 5. Today, Srisakal is celebrating her new role as lieutenant and she continues to fight for gender equality in the fire department. In 2016, the first Asian American Ambulance Service was formed to address the growing need for Asian-speaking paramedics. It's staffed by 25 Chinese American EMTs who live in the Midwood, Brooklyn community they serve. Today, they're expanding their fleet to cater to the exploding Asian population, including adding more Korean-speaking EMTs. Soccer, or football, is the world's most popular sport. The second most popular sport is played with a ball and a bat, and it's not what you think it is. The crack of a bat is a familiar sound around the globe. Cricket is the world's second most popular sport, played in six continents and more than 100 countries. This summer, England won the Cricket World Cup championships for the very first time and they brought the sport to their trading posts and the countries they colonized around the world. These are the basic rules of cricket. Like baseball, you need a ball, bat, gloves, and a helmet. There are two teams of 11, with each team taking a turn to bat and score runs between these wickets. The game is played in an oval field with a pitch right at the center. This field in Walker Park has been home to the Staten Island Cricket Club since 1885. The club was formed by a bunch of uh, Englishmen who were traders on Wall Street. The Staten Island Cricket Club is the oldest running club in the United States. It's been around since Ulysses S. Grant was president. The Staten Island Cricket Club was founded in 1872. The original site was near where the today's Staten Island Ferry is. Clarence Modeste is the president of the Staten Island Cricket Club. He's been playing cricket at Walker Park since he arrived in New York 60 years ago. When I joined in 61, which is what I can speak to, the club was about 97, 98% white English. There was me, of course, and, and, <laughs> and there, were, uh, there was one other West Indian. The coloration of the club has changed a lot. It's become far more international, uh, far more colorful. We have members from the Caribbean, as I am from. Uh, we have members from Sri Lanka, from India, from Pakistan, from England, from <laughs> Ireland. We have had over the decades, we've had one or two South Africans, a few more Australians, um, a couple of New Zealanders. 
and so it, it's been a mix. The club is thriving today thanks to the influx of immigrants from the West Indies and South Asia. More than half the club's members are from Bangladesh, India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. Cricket like really brings people together and I think you know especially in the West Indies and in, in Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka like these places consider cricket like the number one sport and so for them it's like it's a great way to like meet new people it's a great way to keep in shape and maintain those like community bonds. There are 60 cricket pitches throughout New York City and New York State just created the Empire State Cricket Task Force to promote the game. Clubs and leagues depend on migrants to refresh their membership. Only in the last 20 years or so have uh, any important efforts been made to, um, uh, to coach youngsters who were born in this country. The club provides free cricket lessons for kids every Saturday morning. Keep it steady there. We teach them the basic and uh, we'll carry on. And uh, we have at least two players uh, who joined us as uh, not knowing anything about cricket, started playing with us, and now they are part of our Staten Island Clear Club. Raja Durai Bhavanandan is the youth coach and has been the club secretary for more than 20 years. In the past 15 odd years, here in New York City, uh, high school cricket is getting popular and we see more and more American kids getting involved with cricket. Bhavanandan says the club's youth program has seen an uptick in membership and interest from kids of all backgrounds, ensuring the future of the sport. It's like a melting pot for us. We come together, uh, uh, a good weekend, uh, enjoying with all our friends together. We put our religion survey, we put the language survey, we put the nation survey. The only language we speak is cricket. For Asian American Life, I'm Rainer Ramirez. I'm Minnie Rowe. What you are about to see is a story about donuts. Not your average chocolate with sprinkles, but flavors you would rarely find on a doughy treat. And the story behind the donuts also has a twist of its own. It's a tale of a near tragedy that gave rise to sweet new beginnings. Six a.m. on a Sunday morning, while the rest of New York City slumbers, Richard Eng has been up for hours making the donuts that he'll sell later on that morning. For me, Black Label Donuts was all about just kind of elevating uh, something that could be something so humble, but also bringing back a lot of more integrity to the donut. Eng doesn't have a storefront, so you can find his pop-up store, typically held on a Sunday morning, by following him on social media. On this particular morning, we find him in Astoria, Queens, at Beer Burger, where the patrons line up, sometimes for hours before opening, to buy their favorite flavors. Every time you show up, there's always going to be something new to try. For the summer, it's going to be all about strawberry rose petal jam and lavender blueberry jam. My prettiest donuts would have to be the matcha creme brulee donut. So much matcha in that donut, it kind of wallops you over the head. Ang pulls his inspiration from all areas of his background. A third generation Chinese American, he dreamed of being a doctor and studied biology. But his passion for food led him into the restaurant business, where he worked at top restaurants in New York City, like Vong and Megu, in various positions, including as a sommelier. He then took all of that knowledge and piled it onto the humble donut, creating those flavor combinations that made him an overnight sensation. Oh my God. We're so lucky to have access to all the kitchens across Queens. You know, I'm able to walk over to Little India and I can pick up anything from rose water to whole spices. Ang began his passion project in 2016 with pop-up stores in Queens, New York. Along with his bestseller, the matcha green tea creme brulee, he also serves up a miso caramel topped with pecans, strawberry red bean, peanut butter banana sprinkled with curry sugar, fondly called the Funky Monkey. Within a short few years, New York Magazine's Grub Street placed his donuts at number six on their list of the best donuts of New York City. 
it was pretty surprising. I was able to make this list only because I didn't even have a store and everyone else did. I was the only pop-up featured on the whole list. Eng was at the top of his game. And then in a flash, tragedy struck. It was a classic story of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So 2 a.m. I got ambushed as I parked my car and was hoping to get home that night. Never made it home. A victim of a robbery gone south. The difference between life and death for Eng could be measured by mere millimeters. The gun went over my shoulder. I saw the, the nine millimeter Smith & Wesson. I get jammed in my face. I whip my head and I pull back. All I see is red and there's so much blood I couldn't see anything. His assailants took off, and Eng says he, too, ran for his life. Across the street, under a truck, balled up in the fetal position and played dead. Luckily, it was a weekday, and the first responders were quickly on the scene. Did you think you were dying at that moment? When you see a gun, you know, fate is out of your hands, and, you know, you have to make peace with the universe because whatever happens next is just totally going to happen, whether or not you like it or not. Eng suffered massive injury to his face. Lip split, nose broken, jaw broken, and I had to have a titanium plate fitted into my face to put support back in to raise the eye back to give symmetry. And while the doctors would eventually fix his physical wounds, the emotional trauma would take much longer to overcome. When you do get shot, have a gun go off point blank in your face, it changes things. You know, you look at the world differently. It becomes a really, really dark place and you have to fight those, the tendencies to, to lash out and hold on to these feelings. Eng says it was his loyal customers who flooded him with good wishes and words of encouragement during his recovery that gave him the strength to bake again. Just three months after his attack, he held his first pop-up store, and his adoring customers responded by buying out his inventory in just two hours. People still came up to hug me, super, super touching to see families running up to me, bringing their kids, just check up on me. I was really blessed, uh, you know, to, to, to just feel all the love that day. It's been about a year since Eng was attacked, and except for the scars on his face that he keeps bandaged with skin-colored tape, he says he feels stronger and better than ever. And while his assailants are still on the loose, if there's a silver lining to all of this, Eng says it has motivated him to dream bigger when it comes to the future of Black Label Donuts. I like to make this into a legacy. Sweets with a more of a fine dining appeal. I'd like to maybe translate that in under an umbrella, whether it's coffee, whether it's pastries, whether it's ice cream. I hope the sky's the limit and, um, you know, donuts first. I like to kind of at least focus on this for the moment. Eng still has a long road to recovery ahead with several surgeries yet to come, but he's not letting his injuries slow him down. He recently received the Best at Fair Suite Award at the 2019 World's Fair. He's also hoping to build a brick and mortar store for Black Label Donuts. I'm Minnie Rowe for Asian American Life. If you could change the world, what would you do? Well, I met one New Yorker who left her Wall Street job to start a feeding program. But it's not a handout. She calls it a hand up, investing in rural communities one school at a time. And I got to join her and her team on the ground in the Philippines. You could say a revolution is going on inside Malinoy Elementary School in the Philippines, in the classroom and in the kitchen. And leading the way is Principal Ruth Hillipod. I am happy being our, uh, our rebel school head. <laughs> it takes a rebel to partner with ARC, Advancement for Rural Kids, a New York and Philippine-based nonprofit. It's a feeding program with a twist. It's not a handout. It's an investment in schools to lead them to the road of independence requiring 100% participation from schools, teachers, and parents. ARC is the only lunch program in the Philippines that's paid for by parents. There's no, no other. Ayesha Veriyu, a former New York City investment banker, founded ARC in 2009. She wanted to do more than just write a check and leave. She describes ARC as a co-investor, securing food, schooling, 
and a sustainable income to rural communities for life. It requires a lot of courage for a community to say, F this shit. I want, I want to be able to stand on my own. And yes, we're going to pay for this lunch because that's, what's, that's a key ingredient to being self-sufficient. ARC happened accidentally as Vera Yu found herself at a fork in her road, a road that took her back home. In 2006, her mother asked if she wanted to buy a share of her family's farm in copies. Mind you, she didn't have any farming experience. I didn't know anything about farming at that time. I just knew that I liked food and I liked eating the farm's food. But I thought it presented to me the opportunity to gain those skills that I've been wanting to do. She used those skills to convince her family to go from chemical farming to organic, like the farm she remembered as a child. When my grandparents farmed here, these patties were filled with rice, fish, ducks, and all around there were vegetables. The ecology is back. Frogs have come back, dragonflies, butterflies, life, life has come back. While working on her family's farm, she visited a nearby school and soon got a lesson on the complexities of farm life and the impact it had on education. Rice farming is what fuels the Philippines, economically and at the table. It is the country's most important food crop and the staple food for a majority of the country, served at almost every meal. But decades of chemical farming and the wild swings in the weather, from extreme heat to typhoons, has made it harder and harder for farmers to survive, let alone thrive and feed their families. In the Philippines, where 75% of the population live in rural areas, one out of four children are forced to skip meals, and one out of four children don't make it past elementary school. Very you wanted to find a way to get kids back in school. The problem why kids are not going to school is because they're hungry. So unless you solve the hunger issue, all these things are great. But it's useless if kids are not in school. So Very you started with lunch. Here's how it works. Because most of the parents are farmers with gardens, they can grow extra vegetables to sell to schools, creating a new revenue stream for their families. Because we encourage the parents to sell, sell vegetables so that they can also earn a living. The schools also have their own organic garden. The school chef and parent volunteers then cook a fresh organic vegetable and protein lunch which is served with rice the students bring from home. The cost, five cents per meal. It's a strict program. If a parent doesn't show up for kitchen duties, no one gets lunch. The art team also teach leadership and computer skills. The goal is self-sufficiency, so that these communities will no longer have to rely on outsiders for help, breaking down the lingering ghosts of almost 400 years of Spanish and U.S. colonialism. In the end, these are still their kids. They're still responsible for feeding them, right? It's not third party, it's not the school, it's not the government. They made the decision to have those kids. It's their responsibility to feed them. We're only here to solve, help them solve that malnutrition. Ariana. And the impact, according to ARC, is immediate. In Agbunod, a mountain town home to the indigenous Bukunod tribe, we met kindergartner Ariana Robles. Before ARC, she was classified as malnourished. Ariana and her classmates are now eating healthy meals. For some of the kids, it is the only complete meal they eat all day. At Ogbunod and other ARC schools, malnutrition has been eliminated after three months and attendance is up, no matter how hard it is to get to school. 
mga tigtatlo kasuba, ang agyan, then gahalin sana 5.30, mabugtaw sana mga 4. And the hope is palpable. We saw it in the gatherings at each school, where the entire town comes to witness the school's accomplishments. And in the middle of it all is Vera Yu, who says she never forgets she's still an outsider, a Westerner, even with her deep family roots in the area. How do we know that we are catalysts as opposed to colonists? It starts with us asking the question to the communities as to what they want to be. So while ARC fuels the dreams, Vera Yu wants to be sure the communities they serve are always in the driver's seat. They're leading us, we're not leading them. I'm Ernadelle DeMillo for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. If you want to learn more about our stories, be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabelle DeMillo. We'll see you next time.